audience if you're not satisfied with the decision made by the Metropolitan Board of Fair Commissioners today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of entry of the board's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact your own independent legal counsel. Meeting is called to order. We have minutes from two meetings to look at. There was a July meeting and a July special meeting. Both have been circulated to the board. Meeting from July 11th and meeting from July 17th. Everybody's had a chance to look for uh, typos or questions. Never a typo, is there, Christy? Sometimes you can't always hear what's on those tapes, so. Question for our legal counsel. Do we prove these separately or do them jointly? Motion to approve the July 11th and July 17th, 2018 minutes. Second. Is there any discussion on these minutes? <clears throat> if not, uh, all in favor? Approving? Aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved. <laughs> So we have public comment time on our agenda. I stand uh, at the podium, comments for three minutes. Um, please state your name and address if you would. Anybody for public comment time? <coughs> I would ask that you bring the microphones close to you so that we can be heard, you can be heard in the back. When it's across the table, you can't be heard. That was a problem last meeting. You know, it was a problem when you all were taught, discussing the minutes just a minute ago. Uh, my name is Dwayne Dominey. I reside at 101 Cherokee Place, Antioch Pike. I also have a few folks here behind me prepared to yield their time to me. Uh, you raise your hand and acknowledge that. Um, I've got a couple of things to address. Is that an order, Ms. Council? Is that an order? To, I've never seen that Mr. Bergeron, neither have I. Um, your minutes, I believe, set it up for you to, I'm sorry, your rules set it up for you to have two minutes for each person. Um, but it does not, um, is it three? I'm sorry, I don't, I have to look at the rule every time for all these different boards. It's, it's a per person rule. It's not, uh, doesn't contemplate one yielding one's time to another individual. And I don't believe yours even contemplates a group uh, representation. But let me let me pull the rule to be sure. And, and, and with all due respect to Mr. Dominey, I mean, I mean no, no disrespect at all, but I, 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 what I, I am concerned about is the notion that we're going to start having uh, 100 people show up and say they all limit three, yield three minutes to one speaker. I, I think that's a problematic slippery slope, and I'm, Maybe. Sure, and I'm sure Mr. Dominey could, could respect that and understand how that could with, be an with, issue with this public service. With matter. all due respect, this is the public hearing time, and when you brought up my name before, I wasn't permitted to address those issues, but the fact is... Public comment time, not I, I know that. Time. I know that, but y'all are determining whether or not we can do what I just requested, so you're using up my public time nope. to do that. No clock's running. It's, it's, it's a practice that's just done quite frequently in the council, it's done in other boards and commissions as well uh, when a person has things to address. There's a number of things I'd like to address. Number one, the purpose of the fair board and the purpose of the fair grounds. 
is to host a fair minimum of six days a year, according to the Metro Charter. Um, in particular, I'd like to address the powers and duties assigned to the fair board in that Metro Charter, in particular Article 2, Section 10. I know Mr. Cooper has not been able to find that when he's been asked about uh, whether this proposal violates the charter or not, so I wanted to bring that up, so he has that. But in particular, I'd like to read that section, um, or at least a portion of it anyway, for the sake of time. Uh, and it deals with the fair board, and they, being you guys, shall use and maintain said property by holding thereon at least one year for not less than six days a fair or exposition for the benefit of the people of such counties. And they may lease for amusement purposes said property at such times and in such ways as not, emphasis added, to interfere with the operation of said fair. That's the plain language of the Metro Charter regarding this border commission and the purposes and duties of that board. Um, the, uh, I do want to commend the board, or I'm not sure if the board or the soccer team did, but they actually began discussing with the fair promoters, was it two and a half or three and a half weeks ago, whether or not they could operate a fair on the proposed property with the, this proposed uh, plan. And that's a good thing, since that's the primary purpose of this board and commission and the property. Uh, and to be quite blunt, most, any honest person would, would agree that what is being proposed does not permit and most certainly interferes with the operation of said fair. Um, I want to also address the proposed discussion for today, in particular the surplusing of property. It's interesting, the Metro Charter actually addresses surplusing property. That's section two. Dot twenty four dot two fifty in particular item A says uh, that boards or commissions of the metropolitan government can determine property of the metropolitan government in the custody or use by such department, I'm gonna quote, is no longer needed or suited for its purposes. That's that's the that's the the premise upon which has to be voted and declared today by this board. The property to be surplused is no longer needed or suited for its purposes. Now this is property that was used last weekend. It was will be used this coming weekend and most likely for about a month shortly thereafter because the state fair is going to be operating here under contract. Um, the section B of this of 24, uh, 2.24.250 states, in accordance with procedures established by rules and regulations, says the property, public property administration shall make all surplus real property available to departments, boards, and commissions of the metropolitan government. It doesn't appear that's being done. It appears as though it's been determined ahead of time who's going to receive that property. Section C addresses that too. It says after those boards or commissions, departments have declined that property, then the property can be made public for purchase. That's not happening either. They've determined it's ahead of time. So it's kind of curious is that the, the fact is the mental gymnastics necessary to suggest that the 10 acres that will be discussed surplusing is no longer needed or suited for its purposes will be quite interesting. The, uh, the fact is the plain language of the charter is quite clear. And if this board and others in the city government are willing to violate that plain language, I ask what other laws, policies, procedures, or charter sections would they be willing to violate? Now, the fact is, some of the folks involved with this proposal, the Wilf family in particular, have an $84 million judgment for two decades of racketeering. Civil racketeering was an $84 million judgment. Um, the folks from the, the, the auto museum and uh, auction that was discussed, this found out this week, that was being discussed for over 10 months and not reviewed to the council, or discussed by this board, by the way, um, 
they have a $100,000 bank fraud conviction. So those groups, individuals within this proposal, are willing to violate some laws. I question who else, what other laws are prepared to be violated. Thank you for your time. And I would hope that you would do the right thing and honor the charter. The language is quite clear. Um, thank you uh, for giving me opportunity to um, to find the rules at issue. I have about five different boards and commissions, so I don't have all of their specific rules <coughs> on timing memorized. Um, but you all have established a, really a practice of three minutes, and it's listed on your agenda. You have not adopted a rule that specifies a particular uh, number of minutes. Your rule requires, honestly, it requires advance notice in writing with uh, uh, an intention to address the board during public comment time. You have two different rules, one on public comment and one on public hearing. This is public comment time. This is not a public hearing time. For public hearing times, you would have an opportunity for a proponent and an opponent to speak, and they would be given time as designated by the chairman. Um, and that's what your rule provides on public hearings. However, again, this is a public comment time, and so those rules would not apply to this particular meeting because you haven't set that up as uh, something that you have noticed. So um, here, you would be limited to just to what your practice is, and that is for, for three minutes, and it does not contemplate uh, yielding time. Uh, neither does it contemplate representing uh, groups as it is in some of the other boards and commissions. So I want to offer some clarity on that. Thank you. Okay, okay next. Councilman Donnelly, take my time. I'm okay if he did. Did he, did he go over? No, go ahead. Okay. Then to Acker 790 at least Fields Road, just down the road here, Gracious and Grill in Oak Hill. Uh, the Emperor has no clothes. And the cover for the fair board and the director is off. This fiction, this fraud, this deception, that all the activities existing at the fairgrounds now will continue is uh, just simply untrue. And I think anybody realizes that, everybody does. You couldn't come in this building and say, I'm conducting business, but we're gonna take over. <laughs> That little cubby over there, you can operate in that. You can carry on your activities. There is no way the fair can continue. There's no way the flea market can continue. We know the Speedway temporarily says it's gonna stay, but it's not. And the Expo buildings, uh, once all these buildings are torn down, uh, the new buildings, the rates will go up and many events, vendors, activities will probably flee to other counties. Uh, you know, our fairgrounds, is a fixer-upper. It's not a teardown. It needs attention that the city has denied it for years, funding, and uh, that's really all it needs. Um, you know, I went on, online and read the five-year plan briefly, scanned over it, and the mission statements, and a lot of lofty talk about diversity and things evolving, and I believe the director said that uh, the fair and the flea market will evolve in the future. They're changing. They're not what they were 10 years ago. Uh, I disagree with that. The fairground, the uh, flea market is strong as ever. I think the fairgrounds is due to turn around. And I think a more correct word would be devolve because I think that's the goal to reduce the amount of uh, space that these activities have. And there's uh, no other. Uh, end result, result is that they'll uh, go away. And I think all of this, despite all the lofty uh, goals of what the mission is for the fairground, is purely to enrich a handful of people. It's purely to take 10 acres here and eventually the whole property for the gain of two local billionaires and a outside billionaire. And y'all just seem to work very hard to that end. And that, thank you. I'm Tony Watson, 539 Fairlane Drive, Nashville, Tennessee. I live 2,000 feet from here. I'm highly disappointed in all the decisions that's been made by this board, and I'd like a copy of this two-minute reading that has been deadlined out that we can't have uh, yield our time. And uh, I don't think it's a laughing matter either, Mr. Horton, that you're laughing when we decided to yield our time. Thank you, and you all have a great day. I didn't laugh. 
I'm George Grun. I live at 915 Old Lebanon Dirt Road, and my business, Grun Guitars, is at 2120 8th Avenue South. I've said it many times before, but I'll say it again, that uh, it's interesting that you have us do the public comment before any of the presentations have been made, so we don't have the full facts. You've ignored that every time I've said it before. And I'm sure you'll ignore it again. We already know how you're going to vote. You're going to vote unanimously, just as you did at the last meeting. It's a sham. You have already disrespected the public and the Metro Council by having Laura meet with each and every one of you and discuss the car museum and the car auction. Absolute violation of the principles of sunshine laws. Every one of you should be removed from office, in my opinion. And I may be entitled to my opinion whether you agree with it or not. Richard Riebling has been behind efforts to shut down the fairgrounds for well over a decade. <coughs> He's on record video addressing this board and the Sports Authority in a one-hour session, the first joint session, and at one hour and 58 seconds in, he admits that no other properties were proposed for consideration for the Sports Authority. And that in itself seems improper, most certainly also improper to keep hidden from the council and the public car museum and car auction so that you could get this business done and out of the way before that other is exposed. Continent Colby Sledge has been involved for over a decade in efforts to shut down the fairgrounds, was probably also involved. I think this should be and probably will be soon investigated very carefully. You have disrespected the public and the fair board, you have not earned my respect, you've earned my disrespect. And I will do everything I can from here on out to see that you're all unseated and that this is undone. Uh, good morning, my name is Daniel Barron. Uh, I speak on behalf of my grandmother, Mildred Smith, from 1912 Bransford Avenue. Uh, we are long time members uh, and friends of the fairgrounds community. Uh, over the last uh, several weeks, I've collected about 225 signatures, only five of which support the mixed use development. Uh, that's basically 2.2%, roughly. Um, I've submitted these to the Planning Commission and did little, uh, particularly made no, didn't make uh, it into the report that the Planning Commission submitted, but I do want to let all of you know that there's very little community support uh, and the opposition to this is uh, far greater than is being communicated um, via boards like yourselves, the planning, et cetera, and, and the Tennessean, for example. Um, pardon me. Uh, I, further comments uh, pertain to the August 3rd meeting, the special meeting at Council. Um, there was a comment made about, uh, I believe, I can't quote verbatim, but no further site analysis would be needed. Um, there is an environmental site impact study, correction, environmental site assessment performed, and I noticed that it stated that there are significant data gaps and it recommends further assessment, and I, that goes counter to what was stated in the special meeting on August 3rd. Uh, in light of, um, uh, given that, um, I, I want to bring up something that I've, I've brought up to some of you before. Um, you know, my family's been in the area for so long that we, we're aware of a, a cave system that is beneath this property. In fact, there was a geotechnical study done in October 2017 that verifies that there's a void even beneath, r or roughly in the footprint of this building that we're in right now. Um, my concern is that when you proceed with blasting on this property for a stadium and 10 acres of mixed use, you're going to negatively impact uh, the, the residences like my family and countless others that are directly um, adjacent to this property. 
uh, blasting has not been adequately addressed. I've brought it up many times over the last 10 months. And if you could address the liability um, to, to property holders, to the city, et cetera, that would be welcome. Um, uh, additionally, um, in the August 3rd meeting, Attorney Cooper, uh, who I believe is here, um, uh, did not address the, the, the charter amendment that he believes is required um, as it pertains to the 2011 referendum. So if the charter, the required charter amendment uh, to make any changes to this property could be addressed, uh, I'd love to hear more about that. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Hey all, good morning. I'm Colby Sledge, 614 Moore Avenue. Um, I wanted to, two quick things. First of all, I wanted to thank um, Scott. I spoke with him beforehand, but um, I know that y'all had a busy weekend over the weekend and probably have another one with several events. Um, and he was very good at checking in several times and letting folks know on notice. Um, and myself and other neighborhood representatives let him know that we didn't have any issues over the weekend. So I just wanted to highlight good work. Um, as you take up new business today, regarding the stadium operation agreement. Um, this has been discussed, I think, actually in council, even though we don't have a, a say on the agreement, but I know that myself and several other members have asked that as you discuss today and as you potentially look at an agreement, um, considering the existing events going on right now, especially those with um, set well-known calendars like the flea market, like Christmas Village, um, that those are important. They're important to me and they're important to a lot of the members to see that they're able to be, you know, as best as can be kind of protected and known that they've got a priority. Um, and then the second piece of that being, as you consider operation of the stadium, um, consider an impact on neighborhood. I know you guys have been really good about discussing that, and you'll discuss it more today. Um, just something that I'm obviously keeping an eye on. I think a lot of people will be as well. Um, I just appreciate your service. Thank you. Good morning, Rick Williams, uh, 120 Winthorpe Place, Old Hickory. Uh, thank you for your time this morning. Yesterday or, or this weekend, I was actually going, helping a friend go through some old papers, and we found this newspaper from 1965. It's when the fire ravaged the fairgrounds here. Uh, you can see all the buildings that burnt down, a lot of the uh, stadium around the the track. It's very interesting. This was in September of uh, 1965. So the fairgrounds has had a lot of challenges over the years. Recently we've had flooding. We've all had a lot of things, but today it faces its worst time ever. It faces this board, and from within, it's going to be destroyed more than this fire did to it in 1965. If you could imagine, metropolitan government was only two years old when this happened. I'm sure the city fathers shook their head and had no idea what they would do with this fairgrounds, but somehow they recovered, and somehow this fairgrounds has been here. Over a hundred years it's been here. That's why I stand before you today. I don't have any financial interest in any of this. It's because of the history of families giving this property and ask one thing, that a state fair would always be on this property. That's pretty simple for a 117-acre piece of property that's now worth probably $100 million. And because people with money, millionaires and billionaires, come in here and throw things at you, and because you want to be a pawn for Rich Reebling, he's wanted to redevelop this property for 10 years. We know that. Let's face it, Nancy Amons has him on TV. We know what's going on here. Please do your job. Under the Tennessee Code and the Metro Charter, your charter with taking care of this property and making sure there's a fair here. That's the one thing you're chartered to do. I hope you'll do that. I'm worried for this property today. I'm worried more than it was in 65 when a lot of it burned down. Thank you for your time. Any further comments, public comment time? Okay, if not, we will move to uh, monthly reports, please. All right, financial report. All right, 
I will not put Felicia on the hot seat yet, considering she has uh, been here about nine hours. <laughs> um, but I do want to introduce Felicia Bowman. She is our new finance and administrative manager. Um, she, again, we talked about this uh, when we extended the offer of her extensive background. We're really excited to have her. And um, she's got a, a little bit of a learning curve, so we're going to uh, get her her oriented to to the fairgrounds to Metro she's got a lot of training to do next week with um, all of the financial pieces um, but I, I do want to publicly thank Grace Grace has been our graduate intern she has bridged the gap from the vacancy of our incumbent um, to the time Felicia has started. So Grace, I think her last day is next week and she has um, fulfilled her internship requirement and provided the fairgrounds with an amazing service over the last uh, six, eight weeks. So Grace, thank you so much. I'd also be remiss if I did not thank Yomi. Uh, Yomi has given Grace a lot of support and the fairgrounds in general, a lot of support, as well as central uh, payroll, uh, accounting, everyone pulled together to help us in year end when we did not have a full time uh, finance manager. So I just wanted to take some time and thank uh, downtown and Yomi and Grace specifically. And Scott, Wallace, and Misty also have, have increased their workload to help during this vacancy. So thank you, everybody. Um, the preliminary financial statement that you have in front of you is end of year for fiscal year 18. As you see, we did state um, early on in the spring that we did anticipate dipping into our fund as revenues were shy of target and expenses exceeded target. We ended the fiscal year. This still needs to be audited, of course, and we will present you with that audited statement once it is prepared. About 97% of um, target for expenditures, so we did spend 3% less than we anticipated, um, but our revenues for target were 2% off on revenues. As you can see, we updated the dashboard in your packet, the last two pages, with both expenditure distribution and revenue by category. It's no secret, of course, that the flea market is a large percentage of our revenues. Parking is very, very strong this year compared to last year. We had um, an increase in parking. And then, of course, the track, uh, the speedway ha with the new contract has definitely increased their contribution to our revenue distribution. That said, we are going to be, um, when we orient Felicia and she can start diving into some of these things, we're going to be looking at things like insurance. Um, that took a that our ex insurance premiums increase. So not only are we going to review our rates, we are also going to be looking at and auditing those um, those expenditures that seemed a little bit out of whack as compared to last year. So we're going to look into that insurance and low cap and all of the payments that we make to Metro for internal services. Thank you. Anybody have questions or comments? Question about the uh, depreciation. It's not in here, and we we don't. <laughs> we're careful to not put it in, you know, in the cash flow because it's not it's not cash per se, there's a couple account lines that that we don't add into your financial packet. One is depreciation and the other is proprietary transfers. So if we have, um, for instance, in 
fiscal year 17 when we uh, demolished the unsafe structures on the property, we saw you know, an adjustment on that, but it's not cash. So no, I, I can get it for you if yeah, you want to see the depreciation. Well, I'm just curious what will be at, from a book perspective, not mm -hmm. to cash perspective, exactly. from, a, you know, where we stood for the year end, 17, 18. Yes, we will get that as soon as, um, e e all the year end has not wrapped up yet. So as soon as we, we finish that, we will get you those uh, audited statements. Is this 13% uh, under expenditures um, insurance permits? Or is that purchase services? That is that is insurance, and that is part of our, our internal service charge. So it's not all premiums, but it is a significant percentage. So our insurance, that category of accounts, was a that was approximately two hundred thousand dollars, and that's what we're going to be looking at is all those internal service charges, and making sure that those are appropriate, and see it, what we're looking at for this year in regards to premium rates. Okay, Laura. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the current fund balance now, and do you feel like it's going to continue to decrease, or do you see some opportunities to replenish? Um, of course, both um, are, you know, as, as we strive to bring in new business and to, you know, increase our revenue, but our revenue has been pretty, pretty steady. We were a little light this year at about two point a little under three million. Um, last this year, we have the same rev revenue budget, and we'll be looking obviously to bring in in more. Um, that said, we did anticipate and have discussed that fund balance may be needed to balance this year's budget. We've had a lot of break fix. A lot of our um, HVAC units have been failing. Um, some of it we're able to take out of 4%, and others we have, other repair has come out of our operating. Last year we took a pretty big hit in our rental equipment account because our scrubber went down and we had to rent until we uh, we're able to purchase a new one through 4%. So we've had some anomalies that are specific to a year. They're not recurring. Um, but I think break fix is our biggest challenge right now as far as repair. So we're going to be looking really closely at that. And then, of course, into the future, if all of this passes, um, as you are aware, we will have a significant revenue stream from, from tax revenue uh, in the next, you know, Three to you know three four years w when um, when and if that mixed use development does occur, and then building up that fund, utilizing that revenue as well. Uh, another follow-up question is about the uh, couple overages. First thing was on the insurance permits. Looked like we were about fifty thousand or so over uh, budget. You know the causes. Of such, that yeah, we're looking into that. Um, Yomi and I are going to be going back and looking at all the internal service charges, not only evaluating rates, um, but ensuring that our listing of assets, we adjust that every year. So we did a major adjustment on our asset list when in 2000, in, when we did the demolition, and we've gotten rid of some old equipment that in theory then your rate should go down just because you have less assets to insure. So this increase we're specifically going to be going back and looking at um, together. Okay, I just didn't know if it was like a additional events we had to get insured or anything. So it was just normal no. course of business mm -hmm. ended up coming yes. in more than we budgeted. Okay. Yes. All right. Anybody else? 
Do you have any insight into the uptick in parking? I don't. You know the percentage increase from You know, when we look at it from a, a flea perspective, oftentimes what, what Marianne will do is track um, weather. And so, of course, you can look back a year ago and see the differences in weather. So if you compare July flea this year compared to July flea last year, it was about 105 degrees last year, if I recall from Marianne's report. And this year, the weather was much more, uh, a little bit more mild, I guess, That, and we had, um, we had a good crowd. We had a lot of rain last year also that impacted attendance. I don't know if Scott has any other um, insight other than uh, weather for parking increases. If you see any um, specific from an event standpoint, not necessarily flea. Yeah, some, some events that we have, we have special events that we offer uh, an increase in parking, like the Warp Tour, for instance, we went up to $10 parking on that, and um, an event this weekend, um, the 5K. Some special events we do go up on parking, um, and that, and, and because of the fact that we also, and we're working on something too, dealing with uh, the Uber and Lyft, we're getting a lot of that with those events, so some things are decreasing, but um, that's why we kind of go up on parking at, at times, so on that. But like, like Laura said, uh, I remember last July was very uh, hot and it rained, and so we didn't have a good crowd in July. This year we got blessed with good weather, and, and that was that was a, that was a good thing. So those that's things fluctuate. It's hard to even people using the ride share more is really uh, crap in that. But we try to do things to make sure that we get more people in. Follow-up yes. question: uh, I'm assuming we still don't take uh, uh, credit cards from our attendees, is that right? Yes. Could uh, we do like a test one week or at least get them to start writing down how many they have to turn away for not having cash just to see if it may be worth doing it? And what we do, uh, uh, we we kind of do the honor system and we let them come in and go to the ATM and they come back out and pay. Okay. But we can do that. We'll we'll, we'll uh, track that as well. Just curious if it's worth the, the service charges and for losing that much more if we need to be Sure. Uh, dimensional on how we sure show. we can do that Thank you. Yeah. Yes, the, we've looked at that too, just from an operational standpoint, the time that it takes and to make sure that people are getting in and you know it, it, it just takes more time to process that on a cell and a, and a square. So you know if there's <clears throat> a quick way that that can be processed, um, but sometimes it's just a logistics. Uh, c consideration, just trying to get everybody into the site and parked yeah. <laughs> in a timely fashion. Any further comments or questions? All right, have, have you uh, done your executive director's report? Um, no, um, I, I do have just a, a couple more things. Um, <laughs> Okay, I, I introduced Felicia. Um, I do want to address the, the car museum Welcome. proposal. <laughs> um, you know, this, I was introduced to Mr. George Sin um, in the fall. Mr. Shin has a, an extensive classic car collection. He expressed an interest in a classic car museum here in Nashville uh, to display his collection. Also interested at bringing and hosting potential car auctions that could contribute to the revenue of the fairgrounds. Um, that said, it's very early stages. Um, with everything going on here at the fairgrounds, it has definitely been on the back burner and, and not discussed in some time. Uh, we have also been made aware of a local interest in a Speedway Hall of Fame, which is um, of, of great interest uh, to me, of course, with the Formosas as well. And I think we, we definitely will continue to reach out to those individuals who are interested in that idea um, to see how it can fit together. Um, and what the feasibility and viability of those ideas are. Are there those at a, at a point where they need to be brought to the board because there's an actual concrete proposal? No. 
Not at this time. We haven't discussed it in some months. Um, like I said, it was it was an early proposal, and um, so yes, at some point, if if it if it happens, if it happens, absolutely, Thanks. absolutely. And I do want to bring, um, just to remind everyone of scheduled council meetings related to stadium votes. So next Monday and Tuesday are committee meetings, and Tuesday is second reading for the legislation that has been submitted to council for their consideration. August 27th at 6 p.m. in the council chambers is a public hearing on the rezoning for the 10 acres. And then September 4th is scheduled for third reading. Okay. Is that your yes. report? All right. And the next uh, item on the agenda is the Fairgrounds Improvement Projects uh, update. Morning board. Uh, in your package, you will have a um, four page section related to the fairgrounds improvements budgets. And I'll be going through those for you this morning, touching on a few highlights, um, letting you all know just kind of where we stand currently um, from a financial standpoint related to the um, $12 million allocated for expenditures here at the fairgrounds. I work in the order that I believe you have them in your packet. So if I'm reading from a different page than what you see first, let me know. Um, but I'm starting with the, um, the sheet um, labeled demo repairs and expo building. And just from just to discuss that um, that budget, um, there's been no movement there related to construction. Um, as you all know, the only thing that's being done right now, as we've completed the demolition, um, the early repairs that have been done, and the painting that has been done out here on the site, um, the only thing that is going on aside from um, the design of that of the potential expo building concept um, is the work over at the at the grandstands, and that's covered on the separate page. And so what you'll see there is no change to the line items in their current budget, um, only progress as it relates to payment to the project management and the design team doing work there. Um, the next page that says grandstands um, at the top, in one area you will see a large jump. It was kind of a sleepy page or a sleepy area um, was the work over at the grandstands. Um, payments and the dollars for that work have started to roll in. And so what you will see is the strong uptick over the next couple months related to the grandstands and the line item there as construction continues and will near completion um, as we go throughout the year. Um, one thing I do want to highlight as the payments have started to roll in, what you're looking at um, on that document is, you know, from a, in terms of actual dollars that have been paid and have gone through Metro system related to the budget that you guys have, um, is about 45 to 60 days behind the actual work that's out there. So while you see that it's only about 13% um, in that line item, of course, going over there and recognizing we've done a lot more work than that. And so giving um, this dash dashboard for the budget time to catch up is something that needs to be recognized. So I don't want that to be misconstrued by what you're seeing on paper versus what you would see if you walked over there on site today. Um, and as those dollars are coming in, um, one thing our team is working on um, as we get those um, documentation and proof of payments to the diversity vendors. Um, in next month or likely the following month, you will have a more detailed report on how those dollars have went to the diversity businesses, the small minority, um, women owned and service disabled veterans if they are on the project. We'll give a more detailed report of that. And one thing that I do want to call out to you um, is the third page in that packet, which you will see is um, just a list of the scopes and things that have that have or are being completed over at the grandstands and at the Speedway. Um, board member Himmer um, requested a little bit more information on exactly what's going on over there. And so what you have is just a simple chart broken up by category or location over at the grandstand that just highlights the work that's going on there. And so you will see it um, broken out by the grandstands painting, which is probably the most visible thing that you'll notice if you're just walking by, but also um, things that are taking place at the concrete 
course in the bathroom updates, what will take place at the canopy, um, the PA system, which will be installed later this year, um, and then, of course, the fencing and the changes around um, the speedway. And then finally, what you have in that packet is just the overall um, cumulative sheet of that $12 million, just to make sure that you are ever present of where those dollars stand in the sense of what's been allocated to you. And the way that those work, as we talked about it um, at last month's board meeting, is you have the first page, which is the demo, um, the repairs and expo building, and you have the grandstands. And you add those two together, they flow directly to that total sheet. The only thing that is um, removed from that is that one million dollars that is for infrastructure in the fair park and so as you walk through those sheets that's how those all tie together you mentioned the sound system later this year what's what uh, what's the timeline it'll be completed by I believe November um, that's what's showing on our schedule um, we've worked very very closely with um, the Formosas and the, and the racing schedule as well as any other events that will take place there and so in consideration of all those things and wanting to not you know, directly impact them by being out there and something not working. Um, it's been pushed a little later in the year, but we have no reason to think that it won't occur. Um, there's no hold up there at all. For the grandstand canopy over the seating, work on that, including painting, pressure washing, painting, the PA, and the lighting, has to wait till after fair because we do have an extensive scaffolding system that needs to be erected in order to complete that work. And we, um, State Fair uses that for um, monster trucks. The kids eat lunch there on their, their school days, so that is heavily utilized. Um, so we didn't want to get that scaffolding up and uh, limit use of that as, and also they are working really hard to get that second set of bathrooms um, completed before fair so that they're open and ready for use. And as Laura mentioned the scaffolding um, doing it at a time where we don't have to install it, um, erect it and then remove it is a cost savings measure so being considerate of, of that as well as we go through that process. I want to thank Ed for putting this together in great detail. He did a great job, and I just think sometimes we, you know, we talk things very high level, but we always get asked these nitty-gritty details. So it's nice to have that in front of us uh, if needed. So thank you. Appreciate it. The questions. What, what's replacing the chain link fence? So a, a a newer, nicer fence. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's a reason it was there. It serves its purpose, but updating just the overall look. <coughs> okay. To All right. Um, morning. Morning. I'm, uh, yeah, vertically challenged here. Um, just to pick up on what Ed was saying, uh, the fencing that's going on at the grandstands, there's two different types of fencing happening there. Um, again, just updating the fencing. There's a um, eight inch, uh, I'm sorry, eight foot chain length uh, with the privacy slats going around the speedway. Also an eight, in, uh, not eight inch, eight foot ornamental fence as well. So it'll update the fencing and look a little nicer around the property, around the grandstands. Um, just to back up a little bit, Fair Park, uh, I just have a little bit of information on that, that phase one is scheduled to complete in the fall. Uh, that's on the track, on schedule. Um, so that is the phase one portion that is being worked on right now. Um, just a reminder, and I think Jonathan would echo this, but there is, a, I believe, a six-month period to let the grass uh, get settled and get started before you can actually park on that. So just, just to echo his sentiments on that. Uh, the Speedway, as Laura mentioned, the north restrooms are open and operational. So that has been, um, that was actually open for the last race that happened. And um, that was a complete restroom fixture upgrade. So new toilets, partitions, vanities, paint, looks much nicer in there. The south restrooms are also being worked on right now. That's ongoing. That work is slated to be finished uh, just before the uh, state fair begins. So that's that's they're working very hard to make sure that they're meeting that deadline and they're on track for that. Um, the concourse paint has been complete. If you've walked over there, you can kind of see a nice new fresh color. Um, it looks looks really nice. And again, the grandstand canopy work that's going to happen after the state fair, also after the All American race, which is October sixth. Um, so that way, again, as as Ed was saying. You're not setting up the scaffolding and then having to take it down, so to be more efficient there. Um, an update on the PA system work that is also going to take place after the uh, All-American so that they can concentrate and get the work done quickly. 
Um, there's a third party consultant who's been um, brought on to the design team to make sure that that system is adequate. He's actually a Speedway expert, so we're really fortunate to have him. He's local, so it's a wonderful thing. We're, we're, we're fortunate to have him uh, a part of that to make sure that he's reviewing the design and submittals so that we're on track and, and get the best system that we can. Um, again, the fencing, there's two different types of fencing at the um, Speedway, the eight-foot chain fence and then the eight-foot ornamental fence. There's a couple different types of fencing. This, Mr. Hemmer, just to kind of talk about it, what you've been asking. Um, at Fair Park, and we can provide a little more information, um, you know, as we, as it goes in, we can provide pictures, but there's several different types of fencing happening at Fair Park as well. Um, there's a Jareth fencing, there's two different types of spacing, so it's the same fence, just the spacing's a little different, and then post and chain. So there's a couple of different types of fencing happening on the property, just to update the property, make sure it's secured and um, areas are defined, uh, so that's part of what's going on there. And then as far as the exhibition space designs, um, the design team is still in the schematic design phase right now. Those are in, those are due this week and will be in review. So that's still in the early review process. Um, you know, we are meeting with stakeholders as I believe several folks have mentioned. We've met with the state fair, uh, we've met with flea market vendors, we've met fairground staffs to kind of start to look at the layouts of the concepts of where we are to make sure things are fitting, um, make sure that the use works and the flow work, so those meetings are very helpful and we'll continue to have those. And again, upon the council approval, that's when the designs will finish. Um, so, you know, we'll have more work to do after the council approval, after the council vote, so it won't be um, complete. We're still in the early stages for that, so. But on, on, on the work that's happening here. Thanks. Sure. Have there been any more problems with um, damage being done to Fair Park? Has that has that subsided, or is there, have there been any other continuing issues there? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I can check with the construction team. Yeah, not 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 that I'm aware of. Not since good. our last time. So yeah, that is good. good. Mm -hmm. Not to be a broken re broken record on the fencing. So thank you for <laughs> going over it in detail. And I, I, very keenly interested and want Laura and you know the, the Walsh management team and others to be uh, you know involved in those decisions on the you know outside fencing when that comes into play because I think that's you know the first thing people will see when they entered in here so I think it's a very important decision that had been talked about a lot so we've added that topic to our agenda for for conversations from here on out so we're making sure that we're talking about fencing so okay thanks anything else Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is there a uh, on the agenda? It says MLS Stadium update. Uh, just just a quick update for that. Um, Construction manager uh, interviews took place, I believe, last week. Um, and right now, the intent to negotiate is being um, brought before the Sports Authority Board later this week. So that process is moving forward, but it's still in, in the negotiation stages. Um, and then, of course, the design team is really reviewing. They're still kind of digesting all of the material, all the designs, the concepts that were done before, and um, still in that conceptual phase. So that's sort of where they are right now. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. All right. Under new business, we have consideration of mixed use ground lease and land surplus. Good morning. Uh, you actually have two MLS related items that you're being asked to consider today. Um, the ground lease and surplus is one item, and then the operating agreement, stadium operating agreement term sheet is the second. Uh, Mr. Chair, do you want me to take those individually or present them together? Uh, yeah, if we could go through them individually, that would okay. be appreciated. So the first is the development ground lease. Um, 
The rezoning for the redevelopment was approved by the Planning Commission and has gone on to the Council. As Laura said, there's a public hearing on the rezoning August 27th. Uh, the Council recently adopted an ordinance requiring all leases, I believe, over 50 years in duration, um, the property subject to those leases be declared surplus. So that's the reason you're being asked to surplus the property. Um, that is uh, essentially a procedural matter. Uh, because the property is under the control of the fair board, um, the fair board controls that surplusing process. So it's, it's um, up to you to make that decision and then the council by ordinance will be making that declaration. Um, that's part of the ordinance that they're considering. So this approves a ground lease between the fair board and Nashville Soccer Holdings Development LLC. Uh, Nashville Soccer Holdings Development is an affiliate of the MLS ownership group the lease is for 99 years, which is consistent with the November 2017 Council resolution. And in fact, I'll um, read from that resolution because there has been a significant improvement that I'll discuss. The um, amendment number three to the substitute resolution RS 2017-910 provides as an important and integral part of the overall stadium project, the team and the Metropolitan Government by and through the Metropolitan Government Board of Fair Commissioners further desires to enter into an agreement wherein the team will agree to commence on or before a certain date the development of certain property adjacent to the stadium consisting of more or less 10 acres, which property shall be leased from Metro and or the Fair Board as applicable pursuant to a nominal 99 year ground lease. So the legislation the council approved contemplated a nominal rent payment. That was not defined at the time, but, but the, the word nominal was approved by the council. Since then, there have been negotiations with the team um, in an effort to provide more revenue for the fair board. And so the, the team has, and the, the, the team group has now agreed to pay a minimum annual rent payment of $200,000 per year with an offset for the 50% portion of non-soccer stadium event parking revenue provided to the fairgrounds. So as part of the operating agreement term sheet that you'll consider next, uh, the team has agreed to, um, when you considered this last fall, the team was to keep all parking revenue for stadium events. They have now agreed to give up 50% of parking revenue for non-soccer stadium events, things like concerts and other activities that they would hold at the stadium. So if, the, if that shared revenue was $50,000, then the team and the development group would pay rent of $150,000 for a total of two hundred. dollars If the parking revenue was $350,000, then the fair board would keep that larger $350,000 amount and that would offset the rent payment. So that coupled with the uh, one half of the property tax generated from the private development going to the fairgrounds, that will be a significant source of, of revenue that the, the fair board does not have right now. The property is to be delivered for development not later than June 30th, 2019, which is the same date as the stadium construction commencement date uh, in the development agreement with the Sports Authority. Uh, Metro will be responsible providing, for providing utilities up to the boundary of the private development, and then the developer would be responsible for finishing that out. The developer will be required to construct a mixed-use development of at least $150 million on the 10-acre the site. So there is a minimum development threshold. If construction does not commence within two years of the delivery of the site, 
then the lessee will have three one-year exten extension options at a cost of $200,000 per year. Uh, if c construction does not commence after five years, then the fair board could terminate the lease. Uh, the, the lessee is required to maintain full replacement cost insurance on the property insuring against all loss or damage and is required to indemnify Metro and the fair board from losses arising out of their use and development of the property. Uh, the lease can be terminated if the uh, lessee files for bankruptcy, so there's an insolvency provision built in allowing the fair board to terminate the lease. Uh, the lease also includes a list of prohibited uses which mirrors the stadium uh, lease agreement that we just discussed at the last meeting. So those are the, it's a fairly straightforward ground lease and those are the, the key terms. I'll be happy to answer any questions about that. Any commissioners have questions about the terms of the lease here? That, that would, with regard to that, that bankruptcy provision, uh, I think that would be a, an ipso facto clause that would be found unenforceable by a, a bankruptcy court to terminate a, a lease after pendency as a result of, of that, wouldn't, wouldn't it, I think? That is standard language that we have in all of our lease agreements, so I'm not, I'm not a bankruptcy lawyer, so I'm not, okay. not sure about that. Any other questions or comments? Any questions, Mr. Chairman? It's on the lease? Yes. Okay. Um, first question was on the Section 5 rent. Uh, how did the $200,000 figure come into play? That was uh, negotiations between, I think, Laura. I don't know. Were you involved? I know the mayor's office was involved. I was on vacation when that finally um, came together, so I, I was not part of that, but I know that the, um, the mayor made it clear to the, uh, the team that, that um, additional revenue for the fairgrounds it was really important, and so that, that was negotiated uh, through the mayor's office. Um, in Section 8, I had an item of clarifications about the benefit and assignment of subletting, um, basically meaning if this if Market Street Management LLC were to sell, am I reading this correct, that um, they, they can't sell that? I'm sorry. Sorry, which uh, section? section? Eight, uh, benefit and assignment of subletting. Um, and just uh, help uh, me understand this a little bit better, but about the uh, the ground lease and any rights and obligations of the lessee uh, may be assigned or transferred only to Market Street Management LLC, um, or else uh, they can't uh, firm a corporation without prior written consent of the lessor. So basically, is this just saying that they can't sell this without? This is saying that the the um, so Market Street is the the developer, and Market Street is a part. Uh, the the team can probably explain this better, but Market Street is a part of the overall team ownership group. So if the if Nashville Soccer Holdings Development wanted to assign the lease to Market Street for some reason, that would be permissible under the lease. But any other assignment would would not be. Okay. So, so am I right then that there would be nothing prohibiting them from selling their interest and in the fair board as the leaseor would not have say in that or something? Uh, is it between the team and Market Street? That's correct. 
Uh, next question is about uh, Section 17, uh, the prohibitive uses. Um, I see that's also in the operation agreement too. Um, I think it's also in the uh, zoning, if I'm correct, as well. But I was just—is that just to be con congruent with all? Right. Three? It's also in the team lease for the stadium with the fair board. So the exact same prohibited uses are in all three agreements. Um, thank you. Mr. Cooper, on section four, could you review for me again, just so I'm clear, um, just the, uh, related to the infrastructure of who's responsible for, for what as far as utilities and whatnot? Sure. So the uh, June 30th, 2019, the site is officially a turned, turned over to the developer to commence construction. Um, Metro will be responsible for providing utilities up to the boundary of the 10 acres. So that's um, electricity, um, water, sewer pipes, things like that. And then connecting that infrastructure to the development will be the responsibility of the developer. And when you say Metro, is that from the 25 million in? Um, Correct. Okay. Then could you explain that very last sentence that talks about good faith, the allocation, and so forth? So what um, we determined in, in negotiation with, with the team is that, um, that the uh, if there are additional funds left over from the 25 million general obligation bonds for infrastructure, that that could be used towards public infrastructure within the development site. So um, as Mr. Gobble has, has often used the analogy, um, infrastructure is essentially when you flush it, it has somewhere to go. So the pipes underground getting up to the structures, that is um, infrastructure that is owned by Metro. Um, so so, so to the extent there was funding left over, it could be used for uh, part of that public infrastructure, but not for any, any, um, anything that's owned privately. Any commissioners have any questions or comments on that uh, review? Before he gets off, I, just going back to my earlier question on the, uh, the section eight, the benefit and sign subletting. Um, I mean, if, if the board were to put a clause in there about, you know, approving any transfer of ownership, if that, if the entity were to sell, I mean, how, how would we go about doing that? What would you recommend? Let me read this provision here real quick. Right now, any any transfer of the lease, um, the the ownership of the ground remains with the fair board. So the developer could not transfer uh, the actual title to the ground. The developer would just own the, the buildings above it. Yeah, but if they were to sell that so to if, a third party. If they wanted to sell to Market Street. That would be permissible. If they wanted to sell to any other entity, the fair board would have to approve that. That is what that, I was yes, sir. Right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, can we uh, ask Mr. Cooper to <coughs> review the uh, operation term sheet? Okay, the... Uh, oh, yeah, I guess we could do that. Okay. All right, we're, we're going to stay on this for a minute. Um, yeah, and discuss the uh, 
surplus property concept. Can you explain that process a little bit, what it looks like from this end and what it looks like after? Sure. So, so for property that is not under the control of a border commission, um, the, the surplus process is kind of handled by the director of public property administration within the finance department. Uh, in this case, the property is under the control of the fair board and the fair board remains the lessor. So because we have this ordinance that now says any metro property that is being leased for over 50 years has to be declared surplus, that's just one extra step that you're being asked to, to make that declaration. And it's uh, essentially that, that it's not needed for purposes of your operation and that this development is um, an enhancement to the, the overall operation of the fairgrounds. Uh, the council is is really the the entity that declares something surplus. So after, if you make your declaration, then the council uh, in their ordinance would make a similar declaration in approving the ground lease. What happens to that surplus property at the end of the lease? It goes back to the fair board. Are there any examples of uh, this surplus property at Metro's? Please Not in this context because that's a brand new ordinance. It went into effect, I think, in March or April. Is there just other items in the old? old for, uh, for example, typically where surplus comes into place is for back tax property. So properties that Metro acquires when people don't pay their property taxes. Uh, periodically, well, right now, if it's developable, developable uh, Metro's keeping those lots for affordable housing. Um, if it is not a developable, developable lot, then the council will declare those to be surplus and offer them for sale to the adjacent property owners. That's typically how the surplus process works. What about other properties? I'm trying to think of something maybe like the, the Frist Museum that was a metro property that at least to an entity like that. I mean, I guess I guess what, what I'm, I'm asking too is, um, you know, in the in the respect of the rent payment, it, you know, it's flat for, you know, 99 years. Are there other instances you're aware of where there's an escalator? Uh, yes, there are other leases that have escalator clauses for rent payments. As far as other properties being surplused, um, I could probably get a list from finance of, of everything that has been. I'm just not, can't, nothing like this comes to mind. Thank you. Would you be aware of the, uh, like the 50 forward building? What? So that one was done just by the fair board. The fair board approved that lease. It, um, there was no additional process going to council involved with that one. So that um, arguably uh, this could be handled the same way, but the administration decided that it, it's in everyone's best interest on something of this significance for the council to also approve the, um, the lease. Okay. We move on to the uh, term sheet. Okay, the term sheet that you have before you is um, the result of negotiations with the team over the past several weeks. Um, at the last board meeting, I believe I told you that it was anticipated that we would have a term sheet for this meeting, and um, we, we do have that. This would be a, a, an agreement. It's really an agreement to agree, but the, um, the principal terms of the agreement are set out before you. Uh, it would be an agreement with Walsh Management LLC, which is the entity that is operating the uh, stadium and has the agreement with the sports authority for that operation. As I noted in the um, ground lease, 50% of the parking revenue from non-soccer events will go to the fairgrounds and that will serve as a offset to the rent. <coughs> 
The fairgrounds will have the right to access all portions of the stadium for inspection to make sure that, that the um, operator is living up to the terms of the agreement. The fairgrounds will have the right to use the concourse of the stadium and all other stadium areas excluding the field of play for fairgrounds events. Uh, if Fairgrounds does use a portion of the stadium, uh, they would obviously be responsible for covering the operating costs associated with, with that use, but um, it would be available on non-stadium event uh, days for use by the Fairgrounds. That's in addition to the public use days that the lease agreement for the stadium has. So, so the Fairgrounds use is excluded from those public use days. Uh, the agreement, similar to the stadium lease agreement, includes language regarding the scheduling of events. So the Fair Board Executive Director would provide Walsh with a schedule of events by July 1st for the upcoming year. And Walsh would be required to use good faith efforts to accommodate the schedule. In turn, Walsh is to notify the Fair Board Executive Director not later than January 31st or such other date when MLS announces the season schedule of soccer event dates. Um, so there, there's a lot of um, good faith working together for scheduling events to ensure that, that um, the Fair Board continues to provide the uses um, it is currently providing. Uh, the fairgrounds will be entitled to use of the parking lot adjacent to the Expo Center at all times, even on stadium days. Um, in the event there's, there are um, uh, events occurring simultaneously, uh, any parking that is not needed by the fairgrounds in that lot on stadium days would be available to the um, operator of the stadium for stadium event parking. Um, Can I ask about that? I mean, I assume we would parking lot and sell parking, correct? Uh, that isn't defined. It's, it's really to you for, I mean, you could sell parking for your event, whatever the fairgrounds is, is having. If, if there is no fairgrounds event, then it would be, um, the team would be entitled to that revenue. And that's part of the 50% split? For non-soccer events, yes. Uh, how, how is that determined? We have an event at the exhibition hall. That would be Laura working with the team operator. It, it, would, it would be a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, they'll know the schedule because they will have shared scheduling. Um, so uh, that could be anticipated and addressed in advance, whatever the parking needs for that particular event would be. There has been a change um, made as of this morning that the team has, has agreed to that is, is um, for purposes of the fair board better than what you have before you. Um, the document you have before you requires the uh, stadium operator to essentially use their best efforts to make sure that all concerts conclude by 10 and that you do not have concerts on school nights. Uh, the team has agreed uh, essentially to mirror the provisions of the racing contract as it relates to to that so that, that concerts are not to be scheduled when school is in session the next day and concerts must conclude by 10 o'clock p.m. without prior approval of the fairgrounds. Uh, the stadium operator would be required to continuously monitor sound levels during concerts and sound, concerts as well as sound checks and then um, they would ensure that they do not exceed the agreed upon levels with the fair board. 
Uh, those sound level measurements uh, for each concert are to be reported to the fairgrounds and Walsh will be required to attend subsequent fair board meetings to present a plan for avoiding future violations in the event there was uh, a point where it exceeded those decibel levels. Access to Browns Creek, uh, this came up at the last meeting, um, access to the Browns Creek Greenway will remain open during stadium events. Um, Walsh will be responsible for any damages to the fair park fields when they're used for parking. So if, if they have a stadium event and um, somehow the field gets damaged, they'll be responsible for repairing that. Uh, it also requires them to attend neighborhood impact advisory committee meetings similar to the um, racing contract. And it includes the same prohibited uses that are in the stadium ground lease and the private development lease. Question on um on the responsibility for repair costs um, to Fair Park, um, um, there's a there's sort of a, a, a contingent in there that says that provide that Fair Park fields and other fairground areas were properly constructed um, for such event per parking purposes and and have been properly maintained for such continued parking use. Um, I can appreciate at this point the need to to have such a contingency with the fields being under construction and not, not being done. Um, hopefully as we re reduce this to the actual operating agreement from the term sheet, we'll have the benefit of time to be able to know that everybody is comfortable with the fields. So that's something that we Right, be, yeah, because the, the fields will be completed well in advance yeah. of the stadium. So yeah, hopefully hopefully by the time we get to an agreement, we can we, we don't have to worry about that contingency where it's gonna be a question later on. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be able to kind of check right. that box. Okay. With the, and another question with the uh, with the return of that language on the, the, the to tweak on the, the concert schedules, which I, I appreciate um, um, the more definitive stance, and I I think that's a, a really important and um, really commendable uh, stand by the team to 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 to, to, to move in that direction. Um, how do we approve the term sheet? Here today, with that last-minute change from the from the language we have in front of us, how do we? I think the the language uh, for the motion could reflect um, as as amended. And it does address the ability to have a fair here. Uh, well, it, it addresses the the uses of the the. Um, That'd be three A. Yes, to ensure that the fairgrounds Nashville is able to provide the activities specified in section 11.602 of the Metro Charter, including a fair of not less than six consecutive days, expo center events, flea markets, and automobile racing. And the fairgrounds has use of the property except for the playing field. Correct. As long as it doesn't conflict with a stadium event they already have scheduled. Anybody else have questions? 
you. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for adding uh, language about the uh, the Greenway after our, our last comments. I thought that was, that was a nice addition. Um, question about the Neighborhood Impact Advisory Committee. Is that uh, something new that will be formed, or, or is that something that's in existence? <clears throat> that a group is in existence. We meet once a month. I th we take off during the winter months, but it was formed um, as just a touch base with the neighborhood, uh, with the Speedway. We've, in, we've expanded the meeting to talk about other fairgrounds events uh, beyond the Speedway, so it would be just participation within that already established group. Um. I did have a couple of questions about the, the time frames. Thank you for some of those clarification in that operational standards section of the, <laughs> the stoppage times. And I can't remember, I know we have a little bit of variability from the racing, for instance, if it's, correct me if I'm wrong, if it's uh, like a rain delay or something like that. I just, I just kind of worry about 10 o'clock being too early or at least being kind of set in stone, maybe our concert uh, guru, commissioner, uh, uh, McAnally can tell us a little bit about that, but um, you know, I just, I don't know, I think 10 may be a little too early on those non-school nights, or at least worry about that. What, what's what's it racing? What's the language for racing? And kind of help me walk, walk through that if you would mind. Well, as far as races go, you know, they're on the weekends, um, Saturdays, so we do have a consideration for a 10.30 stop time, but we do give um, flexibility to the promoter that in the event of, a say, a late race delay, that they can make that decision to extend to 11. Um, but I will say that they have been, um, as far as I remember, they have not extended once this year, and I think last year they only did it once. I, I do say we do have concerts are, but concerts held at the Speedway are are 10 p.m. have a 10 p.m. end time. Okay. This is, and, I'll, and I'll go ahead and say this is something I've been advocating for. Yeah, I've been talking a lot with the neighborhood about this, and um, you know, as we've discussed the MLS stadium, I, I have heard very limited concerns, if any, about the soccer portion. And it's been the concert venue portion and the notion of having the second largest concert venue in the county um, included has been, and so I think that with the with the benefit of education we've had with First Tennessee Stadium and Ascend Amphitheater, the, the, the need to have these provisions about no school nights at 10 p.m., which is the exact um, same language in the Speedway contract for concerts. Right. If they have a concert there, is that, um, and so that's that's kind of the origins behind um, behind pushing for that. And, and the language that you know the, of the last sentence, um, um, but up into up to the comma, which is what what is the last minute amendment. Any concert reasonably expected to be operated outside of those curfews must have the prior approval of the fairgrounds. I think that there's room there to then have the, have the team approach the fair board in advance and, and, and make a presentation of why they need to move past it and where appropriate. But uh, I think it's important to have that baseline standard in place on the front end so that we can be cognizant of the location of a of a, such a concert venue in such close proximity to, to residential areas. I think it's an important step forward um, in contrast to being right downtown. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, I, mean, I guess would that approval, question for Susan, approval of Fairgrounds National, would that be, need to be the fair board or would that just maybe be Laura? Or the that would, that would need to be what's your thoughts on this being a board item versus a administrative item? Oh, we could always just delegate it. It's your comfort level, okay. you know, I, I defer to your comfort level on that. As long as we have, yeah, I'm just trying to make sure we have some wiggle room now and it appears we do, so that's, that's all that's really one. And I think, I think that maybe once we have the concert venue up and running, it may be a thing where the board gets comfortable delegating that to the fair director eventually. Um, once we've, once we've it gotten it, gotten, yeah, gotten into it, um, we'll know how many how big of it. Got it. And it may be something that the fair director can take care of. And, you know, we do that with the, um, you know, the speedway at this point, just to say if there's anything that is outside, say, the size or class of the races that are currently run, you know, to just bring them forward to this this body for consideration and discussion. So it's, it's I, I can see that as a similar setup. 
Mr. Cooper, on uh, page two, number three, where it talks about reimbursing for operating expenses. About halfway through that paragraph, there's a reference to Fairgrounds Nashville being responsible for and pay or cause to be paid rent. What, what does that mean? There is no actual rent built into the sure. agreement. Um, and, and Mary can, can speak to that, but I, I think it's, it's just um, to the extent they charged other people rent for use of a particular room or, or portion of the stadium, then um, you would have those discussions at that time. But there is no specified rent that the <coughs> fair board would have to pay. Are you saying the fair board would not have to pay rent to use the stadium on non-stadium days? It, it would depend on the the final agreement. Um, the you know this is just the term sheet, and so that isn't spelled out. Um, once the we get you know once the stadium gets built and, and we get into the actual contract, that could be addressed there. Good morning. What that really intends is if, for example, we had to hire somebody to do something to enable you guys to host the event, we would just need to be reimbursed for those costs, but there wouldn't be rent per se just to use whatever that space is. It's more of a cost reimbursement if there were additional costs that we had to incur to be able to do that, and that works the same as with the Metro days uh, when Metro could use the stadium. Um, I feel like that language is a little, is not clear in this document, because uh, I was always under the impression that we would have access without having to pay for the stadium space. I think based on, on what she said, the, the board could, could um, take out the word rent. I mean, that was just kind of form language, um, but it, it, the intent was that it be a cost reimbursement um, so that they're not out of pocket for making the, the space available, but they're not profiting from it. I took it as a, like you had a host that's opening up and locking that's there for the day that happened to be their employee versus our employee. I don't know. That's the way I understood it. So this is the reimbursement of that. During the fairgrounds events. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Just to to clarify for the board, the it would be what you're suggesting is the, the rent could be taken out and it, it would read at that point Nashville uh, Fairgrounds Nashville would be responsible for and pay or cause to be paid all expenses connection in connection with the fairgrounds events, including reimbursements, et cetera, et cetera. Let me get the team's agreement before I. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That makes sense. Mr. Chair, the other consideration that I would make is on page three. Um, that is section three scheduling three. Three is um, providing the schedule to our, our, the fairgrounds providing its schedule to them by, I would like to change that date to September 2nd. Reason being is that the Speedway schedule is due to us by September 1st. That way we um, have time to uh, include that schedule to the team. So I just ask that that date be changed from July 1st to September 2nd. Um, I'm sorry, going back to page two, number three, 
Um, I, I definitely understand the need for the fairgrounds to reimburse for any operating expenses um, that that we would incur to, to use the stadium. But, but I think you said something about nobody would profit from that reimbursement. I mean, there's... I, right, I, it's, it's purely a cost okay. reimbursement. So, and I think the stadium, the team would is a good partner, but there, there would be no opportunity to, to pad those expenses to help. Right, they would have to document what their actual costs were. Any other questions on this term sheet, folks? Thank All you. right, thank you. the board is asking me to address at this point the the charter amendment and the requirement of the Tennessee State Fairgrounds and what Metro's requirement is currently as it stands now is that the question as I understand it okay um, so the charter does reference uh, the Tennessee State Fair um, and the, the, the holding of the Tennessee State Fair on this property. However, your um, private act of 1923 references a divisional fair. You may remember some time ago, there was a state law that was passed approximately uh, 2014, I believe, that specifically made the Tennessee State Fair Commission at the state level responsible for hosting the Tennessee State Fair. That law was recently amended to also mandate that that work of hosting the Tennessee State Fair be uh, done by the Tennessee State Fair Association in a conjunction with the Tennessee State Fair Commission at the state level. Um, that law specifically says that the Tennessee State Fair uh, commission is the sole body in the state of Tennessee that is responsible for hosting the Tennessee State Fair. It also goes on to say that the Tennessee State Fair, the name the Tennessee State Fair, can only be used by that body. So the body that is responsible for putting on the Tennessee State Fair is the Tennessee State Fair Commission at the state level in conjunction with the Tennessee State Fair Association. How does that play in with the charter? That provision of an action by the Tennessee State Legislature supersedes um, this action of the charter is as it is listed here. So this board no longer has the authority um, to put on the Tennessee State Fair. Now, what remains is your uh, responsibility to put on a fair your responsibility specifically to put on a divisional fair. And as I understand it, um, the divisional fairs reference the different divisions um, of the state of Tennessee. And so you have to, some responsibility to host a fair. Um, you certainly can continue to work with the Tennessee State Fair Association to host that if that is the pleasure of the board and the pleasure of the Tennessee State Fair Commission. Um, but that's how those two things work together. And, and again, the law was changed Fairly, fairly recent history, uh, but that's that's how that goes into play. And then also we have the referendum, which calls for continuing events, which includes the fair, a fair, right? Right, um, and and that is that's really the same. That's the same provision um, that we're speaking of. So again, you, you have a responsibility to host a fair. You have a responsibility under the Private Act of 1923 to host a divisional fair. Uh, but the Tennessee State Fair, as as we uh, have come to know it, in conjunction with the Tennessee State Fair Association, is the responsibility at the state level of the Tennessee State Fair Commission. If that name is no longer 
under our umbrella apparently that that's correct and and, and if it if it gives the board any kind of um, um, comfort um, I'll just read the provision of the Tennessee State uh, change the change uh, in the Tennessee code annotated uh, it's TCA 4-57-106 it says use of the name denoting state fair or exposition the use of the name Tennessee State Fair or Tennessee State Exposition in Tennessee to denote a fair serving the state shall only be granted by the Department of Agriculture with approval of the Commission and the Commission that is referenced here is the Tennessee State Fair and Exposition uh, in the Tennessee State Fair and Exposition Act and it is um, a TCA 457-102 says administration of fair and exposition legislative intent. It says it is the intent of the General Assembly that the commission created herein shall be the sole body in Tennessee charged with administering a state fair and exposition. Um, The law that was passed in just this year actually um, amends that statute and it says that um, Tennessee Code annotated section 457105 subsection 1 is amended by deleting the previous subdivision and substituting and said the following that there's a responsibility to advise facilitate and coordinate with the Tennessee State Fair Association a nonprofit corporation for the purpose of the Tennessee State Fair Association operating managing and conducting at least one fair or exposition annually under the supervision of the commission with such additional fairs, expositions, or exhibitions as the commission determines are in the general public's interest. Again, this is at the state level, the Tennessee State Fair um, Commission. If I may again, I was no, no, thank I, you. That's not the charter meant well, I, I, we've got to hold on. I, I, I call a point of order that we, we call the meeting to order. We can't, can't have debate among, about legal interpretations in, 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 at, that, at, the, at this time. Agreed. And I will also, since, since our director of law is, is present, I don't know if Mr. Cooper has anything to add to what I've already. Okay. Are, are we going to talk, Laura, are we going to talk about the state fair uh, update? Is that that's still to come? Okay. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll hold my comments on the state fair until, until we get to that. But maybe. Would you like to talk about that now? No, no. I think we should stay on the business we're on okay. with the with the ground lease and the term sheet. Okay. All right. Do we want to talk about this uh, ground lease that's been presented? Discussion, comments? I'll have some comments, but I think it'd probably be better to get an order. Get a motion on that. Okay, I'll, I'll make a motion for the purposes of discussion. Um, Mr. Mr. Bergeron, if I can interrupt you yeah, just absolutely. really quickly before you did. There were three changes that you guys made today. I wanted to make sure that you noted those as well in making of the motion. Okay. If, if that's your pleasure, and I didn't know if you um, if you had gotten them all, I wanted to make sure that. Well, I was gonna. I was gonna. Is it in order to to handle these two, have separate approvals for the ground lease and a separate approval for the term sheet? I guess is my yes. first question. So, yes. so I was I was going to address the ground lease, and if there are changes, I would welcome the discussion. If there are anything to the ground lease that needs to be discussed, is there? Because I thought the changes were just the term sheet, right? I believe. Let's make sure. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Right. So but if you're making two separate motions, then you can. Yeah. Uh, that would be just wanted to make sure. Okay. Yeah. For, so as to as to the ground lease, I would move that we declare the 10 acres, um, um, which is subject of this proposed uh, mixed-use ground lease, to be surplus property. 
um, and I would further move that we approve the, the mixed-use ground lease between the Fair Board and um, National Soccer Holdings Development LLC, um, subject to further approvals by um, the Metropolitan Government, um, including Metro Council. Um, and that we also authorize the chair to make any non-substantive corrections to the form or language as may be deemed necessary um, upon the recommendation of the executive director and in consultation with the Department of Law. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second for purposes of discussion. I had a, an item I wanted to get the uh, fellow commissioner's opinion on. And, uh, probably we'll need Mary to come up here with her abacus and financial calculator maybe afterwards. But uh, uh, I guess one thing I've, I've been thinking about, and um, I know we've had really good discussions with the team on this, and I just wanted to kind of explain my thoughts for, for bringing the, the soccer, uh, non soccer parking split with the. Uh, in here and how it's kind of a little bit changed from, from my initial initial thinking and just kind of get everyone's uh, else's thoughts on this. Uh, but my thought was around the, the, the time that we started these discussions with the team that the deal was around to say at a very high level, you know, the soccer stadium, uh, the, the 10 acre development and the events surrounding that. And then since then, you know, We've had we've had talk about maybe some other events, some uh, concerts, whatnot. We really don't know the, to the extent of such. Um, so I was thinking that since that deal was it's kind of ch changed a little bit, and thinking that it'd be fair to to kind of share in that that upside and that those different uh, parking revenues. And so the, the team acquiesced to that. Uh, but what I didn't. Uh, in, and the kind of the language was that to be offset from the the rent payment. Um, so what I was you know initially thinking was this was you know that we were due a rent payment a uh, you know and not be subject to a parking share for those soccer events. But you know we could get that on that upside uh, that 50-50 split. Um, you know, it is good that they did have the, you know, it, it, the way it's written now that, you know, if the parking is over uh, the 200000 that we would we would get in that upside. But, um, you know, thinking through how our parking arranged today, uh, say we, we're getting around 450000 today for our whole, you know, our whole annual book of business. Um, you know, this is going to be, you know, probably a handful of events, so it's really not that much in terms of the grand scheme of things, but it's more of a, you know, kind of a fairness from a, how we've negotiated moving forward is kind of what I'm thinking of. So uh, just really wanted to get other people's, uh, other commissioners' thoughts on, you know, instead of having that offset language being in, in addition to language. Uh, I, yeah, I like to see both, personally. Minimum payment with an escalator, actually, um, plus par plus parking. So that's what that's what I think. I mean, Aaron, I'd like to get your thoughts too, just from negotiating a lot of these type. Well, I was under the understanding, like you were, that it was going to be both. Um, from what I had read so far in the negotiations. Um, I also think it might be short-sighted when we're talking about a 99-year lease to consider parking as the only revenue or to not have some sort of escalator for rent because hopefully <laughs> we'll have some transit and we'll have other rideshare options and that parking won't be as big of a deal in 99 years. I mean, we're already seeing, you know, as Scott said, a decline in that um, year to year. It obviously varies based on weather, but, um, yeah, I think some sort of provision for a rent escalator might be that. Mr. Cooper? Yes, if I could address both of those points, and the team may want to address one of them. Um, as far as the, the rent amount, uh, keep in mind that the team is responsible for the vast majority of the payments for building the stadium. They're responsible for the vast majority of the debt. And so all of the revenue that they collect is to um, help them to be able to to pay that debt. I mean, that, that's kind of built in built into the deal. So this extra rent amount actually wasn't contemplated at the time the the deal was put together. That's more money out of their 
pocket, so to speak, that was not part of the initial deal. Um, as, as far as whether an escalator could, could be built in, I'll, I'll leave that to them to address. But the stadium lease is for 30 years. Um, at the end of that, there are provisions that say it can be extended, but it's only upon agreement of the parties regarding whatever rent would be paid at the time. So the thought was that this 10-acre development, after 30 years, the rent associated with that would be factored in into whether to extend the stadium lease further. So that was the reasoning behind that provision. happy to try to address part of the question. So last year when John started with the council resolution, it started with a de minimis ground lease. And so typically 200,000 is quite higher than what we would expect de minimis to be. Um, so we felt we had made significant movement by putting in a minimum amount as well as allowing for upside when we started with a scenario that the team was going to retain parking for all of the events that, that we had hosted here. Um, with respect to the 10 acres, this is additional private funding that's required to develop it, you know, in the range of a couple hundred million dollars or more that's going to generate property taxes that then will be an ongoing recurring um, resource to the fairgrounds. And so when we sit here and kind of look at everything collectively, um, we also have to have a development that's able to uh, be um, viable and be able to be financed by a bank to be able to actually incur this to happen. And so everything kind of all needs to fit together. And when you start um, pushing on some other pieces, at some point, if things get pushed too hard, it, it's hard to make everything work. And so right now, we feel that we've come quite a long way and have something that we felt was was reasonable. Um, in terms of an escalator, with that just coming to me today, we have to go look at that and try to run it through the numbers to see what could be possible. Um, but just wanted to respond to the initial questions there, if that helps. Um, and an educated guess, I mean, how many non-soccer events are kind of being discussed well, right as, now. as we shared with the council, um, you know, we haven't started to play with MLS yet. And so our focus is going to be on soccer games. But because we do need to be able to generate these additional revenues that, you know, we're guessing, um, I don't know, maybe four to six of concerts. Um, there could be other things. There could be NCAA championships. I mean, there could be a soccer event here. There could be a football event here. There could be lacrosse. But we have to develop that business plan, and we just aren't far enough along yet. We'll be focusing on soccer originally. We'll know more, you know, a year from now, six months from now. That helps. Question for uh, legal counsel, then. Uh, uh, we're going to be asked to vote on both of these term lease and operating agreement today. Right, that's the question, uh, I don't know who the question's for. Um, with, with, is there, with, prop, with the property taxes on the private development, is, is there an arrangement for, remind me, is there some arrangement in the legislation that the, some of the property taxes are going to go to the fairgrounds, right, and it's 50 percent? Okay. I do think that's a that's a point to keep in mind as to the whole package. No. Is there a projection of that? Based on the size of the development, um, it's about one point three million dollars that would would come that, that is not received today. Is that 1.3 million total annual or 1.3 million coming to the fairgrounds annual? Fairgrounds. That would fairgrounds. be that would be our 50 percent. Okay. I think obviously that would change over time, correct? As we 
as rates change and as values change and everything like that. We're on discussion. Does anybody have discussion? Motion on, on the table with for us. Correct. I'll make that point. <laughs> uh, I think. Um, we were just saying that perhaps the property tax amount each year would provide a bit of an escalator as this part of town starts to develop and um, thrive. I think that kind of gives the the mark that, for me, from my perspective, that kind of gives the the you know the, the changing aspect to. It. I, I think it is important to consider that uh, together. I mean, the, the private investment is being made, which in turn creates the property tag tax uh, uh, collection possible. Um, you know, I think a lot of times, as we've talked about this whole plan, you know, at times it's hard to, or I think there's a, there have been times where folks want to talk about it in very little boxes and we need to remember the whole box of everything of it all the pieces fit together. Um, I certainly appreciate the uh, desire um, or sentiment to make sure we're catching some sort of um, potential um, Increase over time, um, um, as well, though. So, um, but I, but I do think that 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 property tax that's made possible by the private development needs to needs to be sort of considered as we think about it. All right, any further comments on this at the moment? Yeah, I was thinking also, you know, in terms of an escalator, you know, I, I, uh, I think it could be, you know, at a certain point in time, like at year 11, you could have a, you know, 1% escalator or something we could do, and that we could give time to get, you know, the, the place established and, and that type of stuff. But I think, uh, you know, it's very common. Uh, what we do, what is nice, that's coming from the metro kind of side of the pot, not the private development side of the pot. And so uh, that's what I was thinking kind of in terms of a, a really partnership here and, uh, you know, an escalator and a lease is as common as the lease itself uh, in, in private development. And, um, you know, I just I think that is something to, to think about while it does change the, the pro forma for the team. I think it's, it's a, a prudent... Uh, you know, activity to, to at least discuss from, from the board side of things. Um, and uh, I guess with that, um, may look to do uh, a motion or to amend if uh, I could get legal counsel's help um, for the Section 5 rent. Um, would look to uh, see if the uh, um, commissioner that made the motion would step to the amendment to um, change offset by in the sentence that reads commencing on the the commencement date and continuing until the expiration of, or termination of the stadium lease, leasee shall pay to the lease or minimum annual rent in the amount of $200,000 offset by uh, the amount of any parking revenues remitted to the lessor with respect to non-soccer events at the stadium. Um, in that sentence, so that so change offset by to in addition to. And the second change would be um, lease, leasee shall pay to the lease or minimum annual rent in the amount of $200,000 um, I may need some <laughs> clarification on this on, on how to I, basically I would like to put a you know an escalator a 1% escalator starting in year 11 of the lease those, those are substantive changes okay. to what has been brought before you. Um, and let me just 
con compare and contrast for just a second. Okay. On the on your term sheet, you had a few changes that were made to the substance of it, and there was agreement right here at the meeting with yeah. regard to that. Okay, so you you could make those changes. These changes are essentially substantive changes, which makes it really a counter offer. Okay, so unless, and I, I think Ms. Mary may want to speak to whether that is something that they would be agreeable or not, or at least given that opportunity to speak to whether or not that's something that they would be agreeable for, because it is a substantive change here, and so we, we need to consider that. I, yeah, I would think that I would think that if you know if it's the if that's something we want to pursue, we may have to we may have to defer action at this moment on this one to have some further discussions, and then maybe set a special meeting, you know, after those. I think that would be. I don't know that would, I don't know that we can take an action if there if there's no sort of meeting of the minds on the contract right now with those with those financial changes. There's not really anything for us to take action on yet. Um, um, so I mean, if it if Commissioner Hemmer, if it's your uh, you know, if you're, it's your desire maybe to, to defer it for further discussions and maybe make a make move to move to defer this motion and action on it. You know, maybe we could maybe we could have those discussions with the team and then come back next week. Let me recall my motion then to put it back in regular order. And if I can get some clarification from Director Cooper on our timeline it needs. So for purposes of timing, it was contemplated that the board would act today so that the council would have that recommendation before second reading next week. Um, that is when um, the ordinances are amendable, or at least one of the ordinances is amendable. The other, the ticket tax ordinance is amendable on third reading, but the ground lease ordinance is only amendable on second reading. Um, so if I mean, if the board wanted to have a special meeting, the council could take that into consideration if it was before the third reading, but that does um, make amending difficult at the council level. Yeah, my, my main concern, I don't want to hold up train. I mean, there is a very specific set of events that are, are occurring and kind of throwing this in at the last minute. So um, I think these things can probably be discussed later on if if maybe some maybe provide some further input from the rest of my commissioners uh, that we could probably enter into some later discussions uh, on on this but I, I like I said my main concern I don't want to hold up bigger items but I think these are some items that we can address in the near future if possible thoughts Well, there is an amend. I mean, I guess I would call Mr. Cooper back up, and I mean, we've got we've got um, we've got Section 15 uh, for for amendments. Um, so I guess the question is, we have the ability to amend. Um, although, obviously, again, yes, the the board has the ability to amend um, at a later date. Um, if it is a substantive amendment, it would then go to the council for approval by resolution. Has there been a uh, projection of parking revenues to the fairgrounds through this 50%? Proposal. I would hope it would be significant, but has anybody projected that? I'm sorry, you mean one of the parties rejected well, the, the, the amendment? The, the, the thought being the parking revenue is more than the two hundred thousand dollars. That's what you're saying. So do we have a, uh, an idea of the projected? We don't know. It depends revenue. on the number of of events that they do. So if it was less than $200,000, then the difference would be made up so that you're you're getting at least a minimum $200,000 a year. Um, but it's, I don't know if they've done parking projection or parking revenue projection for non-soccer events or not. Yeah, parking for non-soccer events potential. 
We continue to work on that right now. I think it depends, as uh, Mr. Cooper indicated, on uh, the number of events that are held. It's possible it could be in the range of, you know, 150,000. It could be higher if there are more attendees to the particular events. And so, um, you know, the only other comment I would make from the team perspective is these would be substantive changes and we would need to go back and do some analysis and further work on those uh, before we would be in a position to indicate if, if, if they work or not on this end. So it's essentially great, the greater of 200,000 or potential parking. All right, any further discussion on this? What's, what's your comfort level, Commissioner Hammer? I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, I've, it's my motion on the floor, but I don't want to, I'm, I'm hesitant to call for a vote because I do want to, I, I want to respect your, your concerns. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I do recognize it's a, a, a last minute change and, um, you know, the, the team needs to, to kind of look at that. I um, also recognize the timeline. So, uh, you know, I, I do feel like we lose a lot of leverage and having not having this kind of worked out before we go to council yeah. and you know having the amendments but so I, I guess really my question is to the other commissioners if, if you feel the same way I knew, need, do that we need to have you know a little bit more further refinement on these rent payments then we should probably have those discussions and be prepared to have a special meeting before Tuesday or this Tuesday for the second second reading or before the third for the second, you know, within the next week, <laughs> yep. um, being that that you know is our time frame, or you know, if not, then we'll, you know we'll need to be prepared to vote on today. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly, I, I, I hope every, I mean, I hope everybody's schedules work, but I'm certainly willing to have a special meeting to, you know, to give us a little more time to have those communications with the team and see what we can do, and then come back so that we know we we did everything we could. Um, I, I, at least for me, I'm willing to have that to, to, to make myself available, certainly, and get us get us all back together. Give me Friday or whatever. I can make myself available. Well, Susan, what kind of lead time do we need to announce a special meeting? I think it's just to can be called out. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just I mean, ideally, ideally, you would want a week or so, but we have business. To I, but I think we can we have have spend the rules to, to call a special meeting, right? I believe there's I believe there is the leeway to to call a valid special meeting sure. on a, on important for for, for such a situation extraordinary circumstance like this. Could correct? meet tomorrow if we want to. I mean, if we need to, yeah. You, you have right. a rule. You have a rule on special meetings, and uh, it's Section 5A. It says special meetings. A special meeting may be called by the chairperson or upon the written request of three or more commissioners. Written notification of the time, place, and purpose of the meeting shall be promptly delivered to each commissioner. At a special meeting, only the business designated as the sole purpose for the meeting may be transacted. Transacted. Um, so it just says promptly. Typically, under state law, you're required to give what is uh, adequate public notice or reasonable public notice. And certainly, with today being Tuesday, if you wanted to hold a meeting on Friday, the notices could go out this afternoon or uh, at the latest tomorrow morning. And I think that would meet the, the uh, spirit and letter of the law. What action would we need to take right immediately with regard to the motion on the table? Do we, how would we, how would we say we are deferring it or whatnot to, to, to move on um, if we if we decided to do that? What what we need to do? If if you if you since you do have a motion on the table, you would have to withdraw your motion if that were your uh, the pleasure of the board, and uh, then there would have to be a new motion to defer it and call a special meeting. Is that the is that the sort of sense of the board? I'd like to hear from Mary to see if there's time from her end to think from now. Maybe from Mary, if you think there's time from your end to have discussions with who you need to have by Friday. And obviously those discussions can start in 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we could have a meeting on Thursday, whatever. 
well, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and withdraw my motion, and then let's. I mean, we can we can decide if that's a thing. But I'll, for the moment, I'm going to withdraw my withdraw my pending motion. Okay. Do you want to move on to the term sheet? Is, is, well, I guess maybe we could we could discuss the term sheet next, and then decide if, if we're okay with that. And if not, maybe we have to defer that one too. I get maybe, but. <coughs> Um, well, let's discuss the term sheet. I think we've already there been some discussion and it seems like agreement on some changes. Yeah, would legal counsel like to identify those three changes that have been that have been sort of would, that would be incorporated in, and then I'll perhaps I'll make a motion. Okay, the changes um, that I've noted and that it appears that everyone is in agreement with are um, in section three on page two uh, by changing, uh, removing the word paid rent um, so that it will read uh, pay or cost to be paid all expenses in connection with the event. The second change is on page three. Um, the executive director requested a change from July 1st to September the 2nd in light of uh, pending, uh, existing obligations with regard to the racetrack. Um, and change number four was described by, by, I'm sorry, change number three on page four was described by um, Mr. Cooper um, under operational standards section 1A um, and dealing with the, um, the time period that had been negotiated this morning. So those are the three changes um, to what you have before you that were hammered out this morning. Or clarify some of them. Clear, just clarifications. With those, with those clarifications, I'll make a mo motion that we approve the um, MLS Stadium operation term sheet um, um, as amended, as discussed here, um, and by by council. Second. All right. So we have a motion and second. Do we have discussion about the further discussion about the term sheet? And I think I think I would just sort of in, uh, I'm comfortable moving ahead with the term sheet today because I think that there's been a lot of work that's gone into it. I want to you know I do want to recognize that the team has worked really hard um, to address a lot of our concerns on this. Um, um, they've they've been a good faith negotiator on this. I know these have been hard negotiations, and a lot of what the team is negotiating here are the collective. Concerns regarding so many different things, and you know, re regarding the coordination, cooperation at the fairgrounds, regarding community standards that have developed from you know things that they had nothing to do with. Uh, you know, the Greenway concern came up because the Sound Stadium Greenway is closed. The 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 concert time limits come up because of ascending amphitheater. So in that way, they're answering for so many different things they didn't have. And so I really appreciate that they've they've worked so hard on that. And and, and Mary has been a really good partner on that and been very open to discussion. Um, so I. I wanted to just commend commend the team. They've they've demonstrated on the front end that they're willing to be a a good neighbor and a a you know a collaborative partner at the fairgrounds, joining in with all the other um, stakeholders at the fairgrounds. Um, and I think that this this term sheet is is a really big step in that direction. Are we ready for a vote on this? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, so that passes. Okay. State fair update. Well, do we need to do we need to officially have a motion to to defer the oh, yeah. to defer the ground lease consideration um, until especially called meeting? Do you want to have the meeting Thursday or Friday? I'll just say I, I'm unavailable Friday morning. Um, I could Friday anytime afternoon, uh, and then Thursday I'm. How is everybody else's availability? Uh, I'd say Thursday. Good at eight. I can do Thursday at eight.
you want to make a motion? Oh. Is Friday better? Not sure who we're looking to. <laughs> Are we? I mean, I'll, I'll make the motion. Make motion we, I'll make a motion that we that we defer action on the um, on the approval of the uh, the ground lease and uh, and land surplus um, action until um, a specially called meeting um, uh, of, of the board of fair commissioners at uh, uh, on August sixteenth, twenty eighteen, at eight a.m. And would ask the chair to to. Uh, all that call such meeting and pursuant to his authority. We have a second. Second. Any further discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Passes. Now the state fair. Well, we're about three and a half, four weeks away from the 2018 Tennessee State Fair. Basically what I handed out was just a, a little rundown of different events and things that we're having at the fair this year. Um, some of the th highlights that uh, definitely want to take the time and uh, just make a point. Uh, of course, you know, our ham breakfast, we started a few uh, years ago. Uh, we'll be on that Monday morning, the Tennessee State Fair FFA ham breakfast. Um, it looks like we will have the candidates uh, from the governor's race and the uh, Senate race there. So that'll be a, a great morning breakfast and uh, get a little little time with those folks. Also opening ceremonies um, will be on Friday night uh, in the Agli building. We'll have a little hospitality basically over there before opening ceremonies. The mayor uh, has committed to coming to that event. So we'll, we'll have the mayor here for that. Um, our youth days, of course, Monday is high school day. Um, and then Tuesdays are our elementary days. Um, and then, of course, we have our 4-H uh, funnel cake, 5K. Um, that's on the second Saturday. Plus, we have a Bigfoot monster truck show that first weekend. So we're excited, of course, with all the livestock and all the different uh, ag shows that we do produce during the fair. So we're excited about that. Uh, we're expanding our 4-H um, butterfly exhibit this year into the annex, which will probably triple in size from what it was last year. Um, we had a little over about 15,000 folks go through that exhibit uh, in a tent last year. So we're expanding that into, um, into the building a little more so it'll be able to accommodate the folks for that. But besides that, um, we're excited. Um, you know, we're just hoping for 10 days of beautiful weather, just like any other event. That's the main, main goal. What what other uses in the uh, Speedway area? They fair. Uh, for, this, for this year, normally, um, we got two nights of monster trucks. Mm -hmm. Um, then we'll have probably two days during field trip days. Um, kids will go in there, basically have lunch and things like that during the weekdays. Um, the second weekend we have no events. We'll probably, because of the parking situation, that was one reason we kind of left it. We'll have to turn the racetrack over quickly, um, get remove the cars, remove the dirt, wash the track, 
try to get that done as quickly as possible before the last weekend um, because we'll probably have to park cars in the racetrack and if we do not remove all the debris and the dirt um, those cars will track uh, mud and dirt depending if it rains all the way around that racetrack so instead of having to clean up the front straight away and maybe the quarter mile it would just be all over the place so um, for the second weekend we will be parking in the racetrack so there have been some years where you had races yes Keep yeah, that ultimately, we definitely want to race during the fair. Ultimately, we just last uh, two years, we've not been able to work, you know, out the details with uh, the current promoter. So we went to a monster truck show last year, which turned out to be a, um, a great addition um, for the fair. Um, and of course, you know, as you can go and see um, mm -hmm. between the races that Tony puts on this year and in the last few years, Motorsports is pretty much a great draw for the grandstand. So motor motorsport events are something that you definitely want to try to stay. Something that people in Nashville don't get a lot of. Okay. I will add that we do traditionally purchase a table to support FFA um, for the ham breakfast. So if you are interested in attending that, just please let me know. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. I do have a bit of a general request if we're, if we're being kind of broader as to the future of the State Fair, and uh, I guess it would be that we'd love to see Mr. Rose here. Um, haven't seen him in quite a while. I know he's been busy, but he has found time to testify in front of Metro Council. I, you know, and I've, I've been at, I was at the committee meeting uh, uh, last month for, for a little bit when he was there, and I, I watched his testimony uh, in front of the committee, uh, I guess last week, week two, two ago. Um, it'd be helpful to see him here so we could have those dialogues. I, I, I ha I'm having a hard time marrying up all of Mr. Rose's comments to varying audiences. And so, um, and I'm especially concerned by the notion Mr. Rose has presented that he hasn't been included in discussions. Um, when, when, we've, when he did appear last year, he was, he was here and we, you know, and I've, as you know, have been Repeatedly requesting that folks in the state talk to us, um, so there's a, there's there's a disconnect somewhere in the in the in the process, and it's and I, I appreciate appreciate you, Scott. You've been here and you you've been involved a long time, but Mr. Rose hasn't been here, and I would really appreciate it as as one as just as right. one commissioner to see Mr. Rose uh, come talk to us a little sure. bit. Uh, I understand uh, where you're coming from. I, I can, I'm not speaking for Mr. Uh, Chairman Horton or, or Laura, but I, our first meeting, I thought uh, two and a half weeks ago, uh, was a very productive, I guess, meeting and understanding, I guess, of different needs of the fair. And I thought that was a great, um, productive, just meeting. And I think it was a, a good setting for that type of meeting, personally, um, to be productive. So, but our chairman was able for that meeting and it sure. was, um, so I would definitely communicate that. Yeah, I mean, we've had so many meetings and so many public meetings. And meanwhile, the state commission was shopping around the state, looking at Bonnaroo and everything else. So um, that's why that was yeah. restructured. So we, we, well, I think that's important because to, to say know, that we're left out of anybody was left out of discussion, particularly. Um, your group, um, when I think we've had a good relationship in keeping the fair going, keeping the fair alive. Uh, we've had a partnership with you personally, yes. I know. Uh, so For sure. I mean, you know, just the design of the buildings, the layout, the barns, those yeah. questions yeah. that we, like, we come you know, they were valid, this, right. but those are, right. you, it's hard to, in this type of setting to have those discussions, and we need more meetings like we had the right. other day. I, I understand that, yes. sure, completely, and uh, there are the realities, but, you right. know, when Mr. Rose can make the time to speak to Council and make the time to speak to bodies outside of this body, and then say things about about the fair commissioners. I think right. he, it, it's only uh, reasonable that he would come and 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 and, and join us here too. Um, you know, I think that we've all got to get on the same page here because there are times when I feel like. Uh, you know, the message from Mr. Rose and certain folks involved at the state level are that well, we need three, four hundred acres to have a state fair. 
we can't give 300, 400 acres. You know, so, so I mean, I'm just trying right. to mirror things. Up, and, so there's got to be some. There's got to be some nuance and some. And to, to be perfectly honest, um, you know, I've stated that myself. To have the state fair, if you could wave a magic wand, two to three hundred acres. Um, you have, I think, Populous designing the soccer stadium. They designed tons of fairgrounds across the world. They're a great resource. They can tell you what a fairgrounds needs, what a state fair needs. So, I mean, what we're saying is, you know, it's industry standard. Yeah. It's not yeah. being a dig at anybody. And, and, and even myself and our chairman have said that this 115 acres, give or take, um, can be utilized to make the best fair, you know, if properly developed, basically, to maximize the, the use of it. So, um, but yes, myself, two or 300 acres level would be perfect. I, mean, I went to the state commission meeting and spoke at it actually yes. when they made that vote. So. <laughs> uh, that yeah, that's ideal. It is. Is somebody going to drop that in your lap for next year? Probably and we've not. So probably we not. So be awesome to work together and exactly. And while things are still being planned, let's have. Uh, and like I said, we we definitely need vision, more yeah. working mm -hmm. sessions together like that. So that was very productive. Uh, Chairman, yeah, uh, has the state made any inroads? I don't know if the legislation's been codified yet, but on the new committee. Uh, the, as far as the new committee has not met yet, that is something that I would probably say that's probably going to happen in the next 60 to 90 days for sure. Um, I think they were just trying to, I don't want to speak for anybody, but some housekeeping things that they were trying to take care of there because, um, you know, we want people that have the vision in agriculture and the state fair at who is, heart. Uh, who would call that meeting? Uh, well, basically, I don't know yet if it, That's it or? well, I don't know if it falls under the Department of Ag. The last commission fell under the Department of Ag, so I couldn't really speak to that right now as far as which, where it resides at in the state. But they definitely should be calling one soon, so. We could, when that does happen, make sure that this yes. board's aware of it. And yes, we'll definitely is. make sure that. I'd share Commissioner Bergeron's, you know, um, his frustrations and concerns. I, you know, uh, I was the one testifying in front of the council, you know, last week, and there was questions about, you know, whether we're talking. And I'm saying, well, you know, who do we, who do we talk to, uh, you know? And so it's just kind of hard because of the unique structure that you're very well aware sure. of. It's just really hard for other people to understand why there's nothing moving and there's, you know, right. nothing for us to. Well, talking to air really at this point. I understand, but in the design phase, you know as well as I do that this type of meetings, you're not going to be designing and talking about hashing out all the details of a of a proposed new fairgrounds. So as far as those meetings, I think we definitely need to keep those moving forward. Remember past meetings we talked about sending a letter. I know we responded to one, I think, from the Farm Bureau, but do we ever send a letter to uh, Representative Dresden was Holt. Holt or any anybody? Okay. Yeah, okay. I just think it probably when the, this board gets established or met, you know, I think it's probably good for us to send a letter from the board, you know, establishing our desire to discuss and meet just so we're yeah, making we, sure we're, we're putting forth that outreach because I think that's one common misconception. That and we had a, <laughs> that one board meeting where all three mm -hmm. boards were together. And now it's you're down to I guess it's just the one, right? Well, it's two. It's still the but association plus the commission plus board. So association, but we'd be making the decision. So yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. All right. Um, any further discussion? Um, I have a couple uh, question for executive director comment during public comment time that the new exhibition space would be rates through the roof running off vendors um, 
Um, well, first, we haven't looked at rate structures. So we have our defined rates, as you know, in last year we did talk about doing a 2% uh, to get us back in line. We hadn't raised uh, rent for our space, our rates in, um, I think, 11, maybe 11 years. Um, as I looked back at, at our rate sheets, uh, it, it has been very, extremely minimal. Um, there's also no rhyme or reason for our rates. So if you look at all of our buildings, even depending on the m amenities that are offered, um, there is no consistent or predictable reasoning of square foot charge for our rates. Um, we've also identified and have been reminded um, frequently by both our event promoters and the flea market vendors that a strength of ours is affordability. Um, you know, as you know that there are downtown a lot of expensive uh, <laughs> venues and we understand our place in helping and assisting new events get established we've got many events that come here on a first-time basis that appreciate our our space and appreciate the affordability and and i don't see that uh ceasing uh with a new space but we do need to look at the square foot charge and the amenities that are going to be offered and I will say that, you know, just looking at Wilson Hall, for instance, this building with restrooms and a, and a catering kitchen, the square foot charge is much different than, say, the annex over between uh, exhibitors and creative arts, and that has no amenities whatsoever. But the square foot charge is, is I believe, higher over there. So it really just doesn't make any sense um, currently, and it's definitely something we're going to be looking at uh, to have a good solid uh, reasoning for square foot charge. Just point of clarification, so we're gonna be meeting now Thursday, um, so it looks like there'll need to be some work done until then, and we really didn't establish kind of how that's gonna be done. Um, I'm happy to, since I started this mess, work with Laura to get some work with the team and kind of have some, have some discussions and then Laura can email back the board how that's going unless any other commissioners or, or legal have any feedback on <laughs> things. Have at it, Commissioner. <laughs> All right, go forth and conquer. If you're going to be spearheading that, I would just like to say that um, typically for an outside promoter, they're going to want a percentage of parking, and it says 50% of net. So that's something to consider if if they're if that deal is cut before, yeah, if that's considered off the gross versus the net, I would consider that. What would you recommend? Thanks. It'd be off the gross. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Certainly, then, but but. Yeah. And also something I didn't bring up earlier, I wanted to mention is, you know, when you think about from their business perspective, I guarantee you their, you know, leases with their tenants and their, uh, whether it be the apartments or commercial is going to have an, you know, it's going to have an escalator calls from year to year too. Is it your expectation that you'll come to the meeting on Thursday with an agreed upon amendment? My hope is my hope is that we come with a agreed upon amendment or at least, you know what you saw today. <laughs> or the result well the results of the dialogue, right? And, 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 and yeah, I think can, I think that we've give, that by, by deferring it we've given everybody a chance to kind of yeah. get together, present reasons, present rationales in one way or another, we'll come back with the results of that discussion. Yeah, and I agree. I, I definitely think it's such a substantial change that, you know, that it needs to have a dialogue and just doing it as originally it was proposing was probably not the best in, in all due fairness to the team have that discussion in the next 48 hours, I think will be pretty, hope, I'm hoping will be beneficial. All right. Just to finish on the flea market, um, I would think the new buildings are more efficient, less breaking of equipment, well designed. It's not been part of any discussion I've heard of rates are going to go up and drive vendors off. 
Agreed. You know, it's a. Of course, it's a. It's a, an efficient and consolidated space. Um, the modernization and looking at just the electrical and everything and the loading in, all of that is going to be improved. We've heard, you know, loud and clear from vendors how difficult it is for them to access parts of our building because, especially in a building like Vaughn, when you have one roll door at the very end of the building, or you're having to. Um, bring your supplies in regular doors as, as you see here in Wilson, it can be very difficult for vendors to get in and out effectively. Um, one of the the goals that, that we would like to see in a new building design is that every vendor has um, access within 100 feet of their booths to a roll door and loading space uh, to make it easier for them and quicker and more efficient to get their uh, booth set up and their product in and out. So those are the types of things in the consideration that we're looking at for building design. Um, and as well, I, I'd be remiss if I did not just reiterate that there is, you know, we're establishing a user advisory committee made up of, you know, uh, various stakeholders to, to help us vet these, certainly state fair, flea market vendors um, to be represented. Um, I think we've extended an invitation to several of our uh, event promoters, both large and small, new and established, to get a, a wide variety of opinions and input as we move forward with not only, you know, our building designs and our improvement, but through the stadium and mixed use construction as well over the next three years. Okay. Is there any further uh, business before the board? Motion to adjourn. Anybody? Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.